Welcome back to Art of Greatness. It's episode number two. We are very excited to introduce you to our second guest who is, has so many accolades, has over two decades of experience in the real estate industry, is an avid restaurant owner, a car lover, an animal lover, a human rights activist. The list just keeps going on and on. He has not only done so much in real estate, but outside of the world of real estate, he's been named top, uh, top 40, under 40. He's been inducted into the Hall of Fame. He has sold more $10 million homes in the MLS locally than anyone else. And he has coined the realtor to the stars. He has sold homes to a lot of people, but one really important person was Michael Jackson. Without further ado, please allow me to introduce my next guest, Zar Zangane. Welcome, Zar. <laughs> oh, and you forgot to Thank mention. You. I'm so happy to be. I feel like it's a family reunion. It is. From my home. So, and you forgot to mention one of my dearest and closest friends. <laughs> yes, one of Peter's dearest and closest friends. And he's a close friend of mine as well now. I had the opportunity to spend a lot of time with Zar in California, which was fantastic. I know we met for the first time in Toronto when you were here, uh, which was exciting for our grand opening. And we're super excited to have you on here. So, over to you. How is it going, Zar? What's been happening in your life, in your world? Uh, fill us in. Let's start off with that. Oh, my God. Everything is happening. I'm so excited to be busy. I'm so fortunate to have this great family around me here in Las Vegas. We have a phenomenal family, but I have this extended family all around the country, all around the world with people like you guys everywhere. And it just I get to travel and go to these great places and, and have an extended family like Peter and Paige in Toronto, where you guys have welcomed me into your home when I've traveled to to your beautiful city. And and just everywhere I go, I have this amazing family where I just feel so welcomed and I'm invited into your homes with open arms. And I think it's also because you're such a humble, outgoing, excited, genuine person altogether. Uh, you, you're like a big teddy bear, man. Like <laughs> a, Anyone that meets you absolutely loves you and really enjoys your company. And th that's one of the biggest things that I found was you're real. You're not trying to be somebody you're not. You're, you're not trying to uh, like really excite anyone. It's just who you are. That's you every Full day, whether it's in your uh, life, in your work, in anything that I've seen you do. It's incredible. So love that. So I don't think anybody can meet Zar and not fall in love. I tell you right now. So I haven't met anybody yet that <laughs> could, I, doesn't meet him in person or sees him anywhere and doesn't fall in love. He's just, like, I'm not giving you props because you're my dear friend. You know how much I love you. And I truly There's a couple believe. of bitches out there that uh, don't like fuck, me. Fuck those bitches. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely it's, making it's, it It's in here. both of our balls, don't worry. But you're just, you're just a genuine, uh, loving, uh, caring and just uh, you're, it's, you're, you're just full of joy to be around and uh, the amount of success you have my friend it's well deserved it's just uh, we cannot fit I thought you one said the amount of sex <laughs> <laughs> of course this is where we, it was going to go it's going to go there too as well no problem you took a small pause I was like sex success, success. Okay. <laughs> success success and, <clears throat> success. and uh, no listen we, 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 we love you but we want to really get into what makes czar you know what made czar so far right so fire up your question let's you let's go early on and starting off with what made czar we really want to go to your early beginnings family life how you grew up because you got into real estate at such an early age around i believe 18 so you've been in real estate for 22 years but pre-real estate what was life like what was family like what did you actually want to do in life prior to getting into this business did you want to do real estate or was it something completely different as a dream that you had yeah, I mean, I, I got licensed when I was very young, but actually started doing real estate even before I was 18. I started doing real estate after uh, an after school job uh, when I was about 14, 15 years old. Uh, as soon as I was uh, a freshman in high school, I started working for uh, a friend of my parents who was a real estate agent. And I never really thought of real estate as a career before then. But after school, I would go to the office of this real estate agent uh, and a mortgage company. Uh, they own two companies, a real estate firm and a mortgage company. And I would go in there and I would help with files. I would help answer the phone. I would help stuff envelopes, all the crappy work that real estate agents don't want to do for themselves. And on, 
on weekends to stay out of trouble, I would go to open houses and, you know, just say welcome and hand people a bottle of water and a flyer. Or, or you know, when you're stupid and you're a kid, you jump in the middle of a busy intersection and you put up an open house, uh, a flyer, or excuse me, an open house sign uh, in the middle of a really busy intersection, not thinking about getting hit by a car. And those are all the things I did. So uh, I've done every job there is to do in in real estate from the very bottom of being an assistant to the assistant, to being a buyer's agent, to being on a team, to working on escrow files as a transaction coordinator. Um, so there, there's nothing I haven't done from being, you know, the weekend receptionist to to being uh, the broker of a company to being an office manager. I've done everything you could do, but uh, originally I never thought I'd be in real estate. Real estate was always uh, my my job instead of having a regular after school job like most teenagers do working in a restaurant or working uh, you know in the in a country club or having a typical after school job my after school job was real estate and uh, that was just a job to get me to what I thought I really wanted to do was to be a police officer <laughs> so uh, a thing that a lot of people don't know about me is that I always just thought I want to I want to save the world and I had a passion for law enforcement. So I actually went to police academy. I graduated uh, Camp Pendleton. Wow. And uh, I, I was told I wasn't very good at that. So <laughs> when, uh, when they told me that, I was determined to prove everybody wrong. So I ended up graduating at the very top of my class in Camp Pendleton, which is one of the most brutal places because it's in the coast of San Diego, a place that's really foggy. Uh, and has, uh, has, you know, beautiful weather most of the year. But when you're waking up at 4 a.m. and jogging on the beach at 4.35 a.m., it's thick fog and wow. you're running and you're marching. And I have horrible rhythm. So I would always fall in the back of the march line. And as you're running on the beach, which is not glamorous like Baywatch, you, <laughs> you realize when you jog on the beach, you go down and you stay down and then you got to get back up. There's no... There's no cushion like when you're running on grass. And, uh, and as soon as you you have this thick fog running on the beach and it's freezing cold in California, the Pacific Ocean is horrible. Mm -hmm. So you're running and it feels like a dragon breathing down your back and the ocean is pumping and there's thick fog and it's cold. And as soon as you, you're starting to get comfortable and getting your rhythm, a huge tank blows right past you and you feel like this hot dragon breath and you go, oh, shit, if I trip and fall right now, I'm going to turn into hamburger meat because you're just going to get crushed under this tank. So I just wanted to get the hell out of there as soon as possible. So I graduated at the top of my class and the people who graduate at the very top get invited to the University of Maryland, which is close to the White House. That's and uh, you get to go to Secret Service training. So I did that. I went to Secret Service training. I was very oh, good wow. at a lot of the things except... Uh, Target practice. I'm not very good with guns, uh, which which is kind of important. But I was very good at everything else. I, I'm a phenomenal uh, high speed driver, which has helped me a lot in my real estate career. And after becoming uh, after becoming a cop for a very short amount of time, uh, I realized how much I miss real estate, which is what I always did uh, and never stopped doing. And uh, and I realized, uh, you know, it's not worth for eighty thousand dollars a year to to get shot at. Be yeah. told you're a piece of crap by the by the citizens. Uh, so I admire the police a lot. I have many good friends who are cops still. My best friend to this day is a police officer. Um, I I never get a ticket because I can get away driving fast, being responsible, <laughs> well, well, I gotta and talking talk my way out of uh, out of a parking ticket. But, but uh, you know, and then I realized, you know, all the people I worked for in real estate were, were easily making in one month what these cops make in a year. So uh, I gave up uh, police work within a few months of, of starting and I, and I kept working on real estate very hard. And, and that's been my primary focus and the job that I've always had since, uh, since really I was about 15 years old. I've never left the industry and I'm obsessed with real estate. Oh, it's we know truly that. my passion. Yeah, but, but for those of you who don't know, I got to tell you this. So Czar and I, we drove together to Montreal for a grand opening of our agency over there with Czar. <laughs> so um, so we, drove, we split up the driving part. Half I drove, half he drove. So the speed limits 
uh, means it's a warning number. It's not yeah. according to Zar. According to Zar, it's a warning it's a number. It's 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 a, it's a number that says, "Hey, listen, 150 kilometer an hour or 150 mile. Just be cautious at 150 mile an hour. Doesn't mean that you're not supposed to speed to that limit or higher." So, <laughs> so I kept reminding Zar over here in Canada, if we get they get you at 150, they're gonna get, take the car away and we have to walk. That's there. like kilometers. That's not at miles. Yeah, that's like 95. Yeah. Miles. So he loves so, driving and he loves so driving. What's fast. the fastest you've ever gone, Zar? Oh, uh, me on on a road or on a track? <laughs> on a road, <laughs> on a road where it's illegal to go that fast. What's the fastest you've ever gone? Well, I mean, I, I grew up between <laughs> LA and Vegas as a kid, um, and and there's a lot of desert in between. So I've I've gone over one thirty miles per hour. Wow. Uh, I'm not sure what that translates to into kilometers exactly, which is embarrassing because I grew up in Europe most of my childhood. But but most of the cars uh, in the U.S. have have a cutoff limit. So even though the car can can go faster, it just it just doesn't even goal. when you're hitting the pedal all the way down. And, and there are places you can take your car to to try to unprogram that or deprogram that and and get that mechanism removed, which which I have done. But on a track, I've gone a bit faster than that. And again, when, when you're at the University of Maryland, they have a track for Secret Service training where the guys uh, do defensive driving. They do different uh, practices to uh, drive away quickly if you're being chased or if you're trying to protect the president. It, they do different uh, practices in driving in reverse and getting away from different scenarios, a lot like you do in the movies. And that is where I scored the highest. I, I couldn't shoot a target. Uh, what was the speed I for that? Mind to it. I was, you know, they're like, point the gun and shoot. And I'd be like, boom, boom, boom. But but getting away from somebody, no problem. I can get away from anybody in a car. That's funny because even when I, have you shot a gun? I did, yeah. Okay, so I'm really one good. of the things that I found is it's either you have it or I you really, don't. I'm so really I'm really good, good as well. Yeah, yeah. And it was just, I was... It, it was natural. It yeah. felt comfortable. Yeah. It didn't feel uncomfortable. But some of the guns are heavy as shit. Like yeah. I saw some girl shoot a revolver at hit her in the face. Yeah, I've, I've shot the, the Magno 44, you know, the one that in Dirty Harry <laughs> yeah. movie we yeah. playing this for. So that thing has a kick. Oh, my God. That thing yeah, and you bruise nuts. yourself. I mean, well, if you you're do. shooting a shotgun, the, the kickback from the gun, you you go back home and you take a shower and you're like black and blue you, everywhere. You're bruised. Yeah, you're bruised <laughs> on your shoulder usually. For sure. Yeah. I've seen that. Even I mean, Desert so, Eagles uh, are quite heavy. That's yeah. Right. Uh, our, our friend Wendy Walker had a, had a milestone birthday. You know, she's 30 years old. Of course. Uh, and, and she uh, she, she went, uh, we had a huge birthday party in Nashville. And uh, one of the fun things we did that weekend was uh, we went shooting. We went skeet shooting. And uh, one of our friends who's uh, who's an L.A. cop was with us as well. And my better half, Tony, was with us. And they were tied in first place out of like 40 people for, for shooting. They were shooting like 90% of the targets. They were shooting. And, wow. you know, when you're skeet shooting, it's it's whatever it is. It's like a clay plate. Wow. And they're shattering. Ooh. And out of maybe 100 rounds, I hit it, I think, once, <laughs> twice. Wow. And, uh, and Tony and our friend uh, Shane, who who's now a sergeant, he was a detective, now he's a sergeant in uh, LA County, shot over 90% of the time, they hit the target. Yeah. And I've never yeah. seen Tony ever shoot a gun. And he's like, what? Boom, he's like, I natural. grew up in Tennessee, we do this in high school. And I was <laughs> like, in high school? I was like, in high school, you, you, he's like, yeah, in high school, we, you take your gun to school with you. Like all the trucks have a gun rack. And I was like, Motherfucker, if I took a gun to my school, the school would be on lockdown. I would be in prison for the rest of my life. I was like, first of all, I'm brown. Like, I go to the airport and they strip search me. Like, I, they test my hands if I have gun residue. And you show up to school every day with a shotgun strapped to your truck? I was like, where the fuck do you grow up? And he's like, in Tennessee, everybody does this. He's like, 
Don't you practice shooting a gun every day in school? I go, no, we, we went to very different schools, Tony. <laughs> it, it's funny because gun no, culture. It, it was a secret uh, talent that Tony had. I didn't know anything yeah. about. That's interesting. I didn't know that either. It's crazy because the gun culture here in comparison to the U.S., and that's not really what our podcast is about, but gun culture in Canada is so different. Yeah. I remember working with someone who was from uh, who's from Nevada as well. and Actually, no, sorry, Arizona. And he used to go back and forth between Vegas and Arizona all the time. He was telling me he didn't know a single person that didn't own a gun. And I told him, I don't think I know one person what that person owns that a owns gun. Guns. Yeah. So it, it's yeah. so, so different here than it is there. It's, it's just, yeah. yeah. No, no, no you point. can legally own a gun. You could. My Canada. friend owns, yeah, yeah, yeah. owns a few. There's people that own guns, but it's very rare to find someone versus the U.S. And the more south you go, the more guns you're going to see. Correct. It's just normal. They walk into their local target with guns on their uh on their holsters, it's just it's on just their hip. Yeah, yeah just that's it. Openly displayed. I Open want to change carry. gear for a second. Hold on, one second. I, I want to change gear. So, you know, I love your mom. Roya is one of my favorites. So, <clears throat> I actually want to go She's back. Crazy. I know, you, I know your childhood story. So, I would, I want to just go back, touch base. I know you, you started a uh, real estate career very early on, but um, I know your story of l your life story. You've told me this before, but I want the audience to hear. W w you know, you're Persian like me, and so you, you. But but your mom is such a Iranian fanatic. She loves Iran so much. I saw you, and so am I. So so and 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 I want to just give us some of that background before the age of 15, 16, uh, that you got to United States or whenever you moved. So just give us those uh, years of uh, moving from back home. So we, we see what's going oh, on. Oh yeah, there. I mean, uh, my mom is extremely passionate about her, her culture, her home country. Uh, growing up in Iran, she is, she's, you know, she's, uh, she's got a huge heart. Uh, and that's where a lot of my she passion does. for humanity, for human rights, for women's rights, for LGBTQ rights comes from. Uh, and, and she's always a person who is uh, doing good everywhere she goes. Uh, she, she's been uh, a teacher, a professor, uh, a news anchor. She, she always is spreading love and, and educating the world with everything she's doing. And, uh, and, you know, that's where, that's where I've had such a colorful childhood. Uh, I mean, my mom is a, a very, very proud Iranian woman. Uh, and she has got a really big mouth, which is a part of where I get it from. <laughs> she is very unedited. Uh, she, she's very highly educated. She's got multiple degrees. She's got uh, multiple PhDs. She speaks multiple uh, and languages. She's taught at some of the best universities in the world. She uh, she's taught in Geneva, in France, in Spain, in in California. She uh, that's how I ended up in uh, in the U.S. As she taught at UCI um, and in uh, USC, UCLA. So as a child, my dad, as a teenager, I should say, my dad lived in Vegas, which is why I'm here now. Mm. And mom taught in uh, Orange County and L.A. So I've traveled between the two places quite a bit. Uh, the early part of my childhood, uh, I, I spent uh, the very beginning of my childhood, I spent in Nice, France. And then uh, I always spoke Farsi. Farsi, even though I don't know how to read and write in, in Farsi, it's the first language I've ever spoke because it was important for my parents to uh, for for their kids to and speak your mom Iranian. speaks Farsi to you at home, and I've seen you anywhere you are. She always she always uh, speaks Farsi to you, which that's why you know you, you can speak. But nobody knows that you can. But I know, which, and you speak very well. A little bit of accent, but it's it's it's. I love it. Go on. Yeah, I, I mean, I I don't know the accent because I've never, sadly, I've never been to Iran. It's it's a dream of mine to go there someday when the political climate changes. Uh, because uh, everything I know about Iran is it's a beautiful culture, uh, and everything I see about Iran now is is the ugly part of of the political climate today. Uh, but I hope things things do change there, and and my heart bleeds for all the young people who are, are looking for a change there. Uh, and, and I do hope that change finally comes after all these years, but uh, that's why it was important for, for my mom, especially that, that I don't lose that connection. So Farsi is the only language I ever spoke at home, but when my friends 
uh, hear me speaking on the phone with my mom or the, you know, all of my friends end up meeting my mom because she is uh, such a big part of my life when she's not mad at me. And she's very passionate, so she gets mad at me all the time and tells me I'm an asshole and to fuck off and won't talk to me for a while. So that's also part of having a very close relationship with your mom. And she's less of a mom and more of a friend. So if you have any friends, especially a Persian friend or or any culture that's very passionate and family oriented, like a big Italian family, uh, it, it, it's normal for your mom to say, fuck off, don't talk to me. So, uh, so that happens a bit too. But all of my friends really get to know my mom. You know, Peter, Paige, Nareet, when you guys were all here, we, we went out with her quite a few times. And, and you know it's not a normal mother and son type of relationship. <laughs> uh, so I grew up, even though I don't know how to read and write in Farsi, it's the only language I spoke at home. Uh, and then uh, the first couple of years of my life, I, I lived in France, so I started speaking French. And then by the age of about two, my parents moved to the south of Spain. I grew up living in Marbella most of my childhood. And uh, I went to school in Spain, so I learned how to read and write in Spanish. And I stopped speaking French, which is a huge disappointment for my mom because she's also a French professor mm -hmm. and that's her primary language. She grew up uh, her teenage years living in uh, in Switzerland. Uh, so French is her primary language, ironically, and it's a language I speak the least. I, I hardly speak it. I, I barely understand it. And then uh, when I was a young teenage kid, my parents moved to the States and I learned English as about a 12 year old or so. Uh, so it's my third language. Uh, of course, today it's the language I speak the most, but I didn't learn how to read and write it until I was a teenager. And, uh, and that became my last language that I learned. And, and uh, I do know that languages are really hard to learn as an adult. So when you're a kid, you pick things up much easier. Uh, and that, that's quite a bit of my, my, um, my bringing up. I come from a really small family. Both my mom and dad are only children to much older parents. Mm -hmm. So I, I didn't grow up with a lot of uh, interaction with my grandparents. Unfortunately, uh, they've all passed away now. Uh, my grandfather was the last remaining grandparent, uh, which I loved very much, but he was in Iran, so I didn't get to... Uh, see him very much. And because my parents were only children, I don't have any aunts, uncles, cousins. I just have one sister. Uh, and uh, and luckily, she has a couple little girls. So I have some nieces. But I grew up in a very small family. Therefore, the people around me become my family. And, uh, and like, uh, like my friend Craig Hogan, and Wendy Walker always say, that's that's the best kind of family. That's your chosen family, the people that come into your life exactly. and you have a strong connection with beautiful people like Peter and Paige who you connect with. And and sometimes that's that's the best kind of family because you're not forced to like them. You grow <laughs> to love them. So sometimes your blood family, uh, you know, uh, aren't the best people, but you, you're forced to be with them. And the people that you choose to be with end up being the best family members. So I'm very blessed to have a very good group of people around me that that are my chosen family. I have a phenomenal partner who who's been a blessing in my life, which is which is Tony. And then the best part is uh, I have uh, I have lots of four legged children. We have Great Danes that uh, this you is, have this six dogs. I know I I know that, but. But tell us yeah. about that. So, so what happened there? Why, why, why do you, what, because that was always a question for me uh, to know. Do you have six great, and you always had six great in dogs. That's what you told me for, for many, many, many years. And I, I don't want to get into you had chickens and all of that stuff in your backyard, because that's a whole story of, of its own and it should be a podcast of its own. So, so <laughs> you, <laughs> I know, I know you love the great, uh, you know, uh, the, those dogs, like your babies and you have that truck in the back. So, so, uh, tell us a little bit about that. And also we want to get into the actual, the beautiful no, 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 stories. Keep going. I love well, well, those stories. The stories are going to be after. I can't wait. No, no, the yeah, that's I mean, in the end. We're, we want to focus I on you. Dogs. Uh, the dog, I dog love, life. I mean, I love all animals. I, you know, I, I usually say like, uh, I like some of the people I meet, but I like all the dogs I meet. <laughs> I mean, 
dogs are dogs are just pure love they're they're great uh you know how how often do you meet you know anything in this world that loves you more than it loves itself and is just pure unconditional love so dogs are great i mean uh you know peter you know you know when i come to your house yeah. my favorite person to visit at the house is bentley, bentley. <laughs> it's not <laughs> us it's bentley he, he's the best at the you know, office I, i'll is the say hi to bentley and then i'll give you and page a big hug exactly. and a kiss but first it's bentley <laughs> so you know dogs are just su such beautiful caring creatures so uh i i naturally started with you know one great dane and then it started being two and you know they're such big beautiful gentle creatures uh and and they're they're just so majestic and people get them all the time and they say i didn't realize it was going to get so big and then they don't want to take care of them so they put them up for rescue they don't want to take care of them they're expensive to feed and take care of so we we've just always opened up our home and somehow uh the number six has always been been in my universe it's like Uh, my driver's license number has a bunch of sixes. My social security number is all sixes. Uh, we, we, you know, our, our restaurant is number six in the city. Uh, our office address starts with a six. You know, just, I don't know. The number six is always there. Uh, every time we've had a dog pass away from old age, which we've been very fortunate, they all live a very long time. Mm. As soon as one passes away and I'm like, okay, we only have five dogs now. <laughs> we're, we're, we're getting to a balance. Yeah. It's like somebody will call and say, there's a dog in the pound. You know, if somebody doesn't pick it up today, it's going to be put to sleep oh, because no. it just, it times up. And I'm like, it'll get picked up today. Somebody will pick it up. And at 4 30, they're like 30 more minutes. And I'm like, Dear. I'm on my way. <laughs> you know, I, I I just can't help it, but it yeah. it six is the number. Amazing. So did you have it, animals it, growing up, or was this something that you got into later in life? No, I've always grown up with dogs. My family's always had big dogs. Uh, uh, since before I was born, my parents had German shepherds, Belgian shepherds, Malinois. We've always had big dogs. Uh, a Dalmatian's the smallest dog I ever had. So big dogs, pit bulls, everything. My parents always loved big dogs. But uh, when I lost my last dog, uh, as my childhood dog, I was in my 20s. And I had a dog pass away at 16 years old. And, uh, and I went a few months, close to a year without a dog. I just needed to, to, uh, to take a little time off and grieve. And I remember I had a next door neighbor uh, when I was a kid in California who uh, they were like the coolest couple. There was like this cool lesbian couple. They had a big truck, they had spiky hair, and they had this beautiful Great Dane that was black and white, like in the old Lady Gaga videos. And I was like, these bitches are so cool. <laughs> I was like, I, I had dog envy for the first time. I was like, they have the coolest dog. They're these badass chicks. I was like, I want to grow up and be like them. I didn't know what lesbians are all about <laughs> but i was like i want to grow up and be like these bitches are badass and then when when my dog had passed away and some time had gone by more than six months went by and i had grieved i was like you know uh, i want to change things up i, I want to get a dog that you know i as an adult uh, i'm gonna figure out what breed is best for me and nothing was falling into my universe there was nothing that was saying you know this dog has to be adopted. So I started doing research and the more I learned about Great Danes, the more I realized that that goes with me, that that fits my lifestyle. And uh, and I did so much research and and it just worked. So I, uh, I reached out to a breeder, which, you know, today, my Great Danes, four of the four of the six are all rescues. But at the time, I reached out to a breeder and uh, And uh, I ended up talking to actually four or five different breeders and Great Danes are pretty large dogs. Most of the breeders live in the middle of the country, in the middle of nowhere. And, uh, and uh, one of them said, sure, come over and meet the dogs. So I drove uh, from Vegas to, uh, to, I think it was Oklahoma. And wow. I met this breeder and I loved this dog that she had. She had a beautiful puppy. And, uh, and I knew the dog was going to be mine immediately because uh, we'll get to this a little bit later, but, you know, Michael Jackson was, was a person who changed my life and, and changed my universe. And, you know, I give him all the credit for, for my career, but his daughter Paris has these beautiful eyes that were the color of 
honey. Like I've never seen anybody with eyes as beautiful as her. And I would always say they're, they're just unique. They were beautiful because they were unlike anything I've ever mm -hmm. seen. And, and I spent Christmas with them. I spent birthday parties with, with his family. I had spent a lot of time with, with him in, in Paris when they were very young. And when I saw this puppy, there was two girls and I was going to get a girl. And one of them just looked not right. The eyes were super close to each other. This <laughs> dog looked like it had been near a power plant for a long time. Oh, Jesus. And then there was this other puppy that had these eyes that looked like Paris. So I took the puppy home. I said, I have to have the puppy, even though I have appointments to meet like four or five breeders, I'm taking this one home. And it was the first dog I met and the eyes just connected with me immediately. Well, I took the dog home and the dog hated me. Oh, it's no. Like the worst you take a puppy home and you're like, oh, how cute. They love you. I take this dog home and immediately starts crying and weeping. And it was like, who are you? Why are you taking me away from my sister? And it, the dog hated me. So the next day uh, I go, I'm driving like another six, seven hours to go to the next city, which one of my clients had a beautiful mansion. And they said, well, if you're driving to the middle of the country, drive a little bit more. We have a huge house on the lake. Go stay there. So I go, I stay there, and very close to that city was another breeder who had a male Great Dane, and I said, well, I'm already here. I'm just going to go meet them. <laughs> I've been talking to these people online for the longest time. It's rude if I don't go. So the girls in my office are like, well, come back home. You already got a dog. I go, no, no, it's rude if I, I've been talking to these people online for like three months. Let me just go meet them and learn more about the dog. So I go, I meet them. They have a boy dog. And for the first time in, I don't know, 12 hours that I had this puppy, it stopped crying. Oh, wow. Because the dog hated me. And she meets the boy. She loves the boy. And the lady's like, well, you know, you probably don't want this boy. He's he's already three, four months old. It's too old. I'm probably going to keep him. And he's so beautiful. I'm going to keep him and turn him into a stud who is just going to stay here and make more babies when he gets older. And I said, can I just buy this dog, ma'am? I said, <laughs> This, this little bitch has not stopped crying since I <laughs> bought her yesterday. And, and she's obsessed with this boy. So long story short, I ended up with two dogs. I called the office and I said, okay, who's the next breeder I'm going to go meet since I'm already in the middle of the country? And the girls in my office know me. They're like, get your ass back to the office. You're fucking crazy. You're going to meet like five breeders and you're going to come home with five or six dogs. Every person you meet is going to sell you a dog. They're going to tell you some bullshit story. And you're going to buy it. So come home. So I came home with two puppies and then we ended up rescuing all these other dogs. They, they basically like, sold you on every dog they've ever had. It doesn't take much to sell you on it though. Which is why I only met yeah, yeah. two dog breeders. <laughs> Go figure. If I would have met 10 dog breeders, I would have come home with 10 puppies. 10 so puppies. You mentioned something that I want to go back to and kind of roll into. So you mentioned restaurants and the number six. Now, how do you get into restaurants from the real estate side? And you really didn't have any restaurant background. So talk to me about that. Talk to us about that. Uh, what happened there? How many restaurants do you have? Which ones are they? Let's find out how this came to be. I love it. Yeah, so earlier I mentioned I've done like every job there was to do in real estate when I was a kid. And um, one of the things I, I did in real estate was uh, to make sure uh, I loved the job and to experience a lot of different things. Uh, I had an internship when I was very young. Uh, I think I was like 18 years old. Uh, I had an internship with a commercial real estate brokerage. And one of my first jobs in real estate was I was getting paid uh, 10 bucks an hour to study demographics, traffic counts. And I was working for a fast food company, helping them figure out where to build uh, new locations. Mm -hmm. And this was a restaurant that had 23 locations in the Vegas Valley and they wanted to build 60 stores total. So uh, I would I would help, you know, with whatever uh, low grade, bottom of the barrel uh, intern would do, which meant like printing reports and going through traffic studies. But being an ambitious kid, being, uh, being putting that Persian mind to work <laughs> uh, and being an insomniac, I never go to sleep. I was a total nerd. And I would watch uh, the government channel, which is, um, I don't know, I think every city has one of these where 
you watch the uh, where you watch the city council meetings where people go up to the the mayor's office and in front of the planning commission and they ask for zoning changes mm -hmm. and uh, and approval. So uh, like at one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning when I can't sleep and I'm reading traffic reports and where traffic lights are going to go up and where uh, where developers are building homes. I would have that on the background of the TV and I'm paying attention and where they would say like, oh, we're going to bulldoze this old crappy, you know, five houses and we're ripping it down to build a grocery store. Uh, I would take note of that and I would listen to where the intersection is. And then I would go to the boss a couple of days later and go, hey, we should uh, lease a pad site here or we should build uh we should build a restaurant here because i understand they're going to build a 40,000 square foot grocery store with you know with a mcdonald's and a starbucks and all this stuff here so we should be building a restaurant here and they that's would incredible. be like oh how do you know that so mm -hmm. uh that that was one of my very first jobs there and then uh the first place i suggested became the number one uh unit for the restaurant chain in the state of nevada Wow. And then the second location I suggested became number one, beating my first one. And to this day is still the number one location for the restaurant chain. And then uh, I was bragging about this because I was 18 years old and I was uh, an idiot. I was bragging about this to somebody I knew who was in real estate. And I was like, oh, my God, can you believe these fucking people pay me $10 an hour to sit there? And all I do is like watch TV and read these reports and like, look at where the best traffic count numbers are and I'm making 10 freaking dollars an hour and all these other kids are making like five dollars an hour you know doing fries and working the drive-thru and I get to sit in a nice air-conditioned office and this person like this woman looked at me and I remember to this day like the feeling I got in my stomach because she looked at me like I was such an idiot she was like you think you're doing something special, getting $10 an hour. And I was like, uh, yeah, I make like twice as much as everybody else working at the same company. And they're over there like asking people if they want fries with that. And I just get to sit in an office and eat all the snacks and get myself coffee. And she's like, you're an idiot kid. She's like the broker who writes up the deal and cuts the, cuts the, uh, cuts the deal with the landowner and makes it all happen is probably getting like a hundred, a hundred and fifty thousand dollar commission check for making wow. that happen. And you're over here talking about you get ten dollars an hour. She's like, I wouldn't brag about that to anybody because you sound stupid. And I was like, This bitch. I was like, she just took me to school. I was like, uh, okay, this is bullshit. So I thought about it and I was like, oh my God, somebody is getting a big fat commission. Yeah. So again, being a stupid 18 year old, I thought about it and a few days later, I went to the head of the division of development at the company and just being such a dumbass, I go in there and I go, uh, excuse me, I am doing all the hard work here. I am coming up with gold and then you guys go and write this shit up and some fucking broker who doesn't know anything is making a hundred thousand dollars and they go listen dumbass you just made a suggestion you literally said here's an intersection and here's a traffic count they go you don't know demographics you don't know the population of the area mm -hmm. you don't know what these people are buying selling you don't know trends you don't know easements you don't know any of this shit so if you want to make more money figure it out you need to work closer with these guys you've got a lot more work to do you don't know how to negotiate a contract. You don't know any of these things. So they go, good job on your recommendations. Instead of 10 bucks an hour, we're going to give you 20 bucks an hour. And we'll let you work closer with the brokers instead of just data processing and figuring things out. You didn't have and a license. And that's when I was like, no. Okay. And that's when I knew I was like, real estate is for me. Because then I thought, holy shit, I'm the best negotiator. I just doubled my income from 10 to 20 bucks an hour. <laughs> And they're going to teach me more shit for free. <laughs> oh, my so, God. I, I, like, I, I just knew real estate was for me. But at the end of the day, I was I was never passionate about commercial real estate because mm -hmm. commercial is is there's nothing emotional about it. It's just black and white. Mm -hmm. It's all about 
numbers, numbers, numbers. Does it pencil? Does it work? What's the traffic count? What's the cash flow? Uh, you know, there's nothing that talks to your heart about commercial real estate. Like nobody gives a crap about numbers. Nobody cares if it pencils. Nobody cares about any of that stuff when you're shopping for yourself for a home. Yeah. When you're looking for a home, it's all about, do you love it? Do you not love it? Emotion. Nobody cares about comps, frankly, when you're looking to move your family there. It's like, do you feel good about it? I, like, I always tell people, I'm like, I don't sell houses. I just connect things. Like, when you open the front door of a house, and I, I buy houses for myself all the time. Even when I buy an investment property, I have to like it. Mm -hmm. You know, it could have the best returns, but I have to like it. I always say, like, oh, my God, if if I was remodeling in my house, if if my house got hit by a natural disaster, if, God forbid, like, the worst thing happens and I lose everything, would I move here? Would I be happy here? Like, I have to be excited about it because you want your tenants to also be happy. Yeah, of course. So I always tell people, I'm like, the first five, 10 seconds you walk into the house, you know whether you like it or not. I could be the best salesperson ever, but I can't make you like a house that you don't like. No. There's nothing that can come out of my mouth. There's no sales skills that I could I can have in me that's going to make you want to buy a house if you don't like it. So if you open the front door and you're like, this house is not for me, the best thing I can do as your broker say, you don't like it, let's move on and find something else that you're going to fall in love That's with. Right. Because if I'm trying to sell you something you don't like, I'm just going to frustrate you as a client. Mm -hmm. It's the worst when brokers actually, there's agents out there that will try to convince you of shit and say, hey, it's a great house. You should buy this. Well, if no. I don't love it, I don't want to buy it. If you don't love it, move on. It's I okay. We'll find you something you love. I always say, especially <laughs> in residential sales, is we don't sell homes. We sell emotions. Okay? Mm -hmm. So the, 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 the buyer needs to fall in love with exactly what you said, Zar. And they need to fall in love because they're the one that are going to be living in that house for five to ten years minimum, right? So, and everybody, you know, moves every five years per se. So, they need to fall in love with the house. So, it's it, it's not rocket science. They have, if you're not, if they're not emotionally invested in that house, it means nothing. Okay, so when did you actually... Well, here's a couple of things on that note, Peter. It's, you know, 80% of our clients are, are repeat clients. So I want you to love that house. I want to love the house mm -hmm. because uh, chances are 80%, you're going to call me in a few years to list that house and sell it. Exactly. And if I sold you a piece of shit, now I have to call back and in a few years sell it again. I don't want to tell you, oh, Peter, we're going to have a really hard time selling this <laughs> ugly piece of crap because then they're going to be like... Hey, asshole, second. you, you sold, sold me this ugly piece of shit. Like, what do you mean you, you're going to have a hard time selling it? You didn't have a hard time selling it to me. So but it, but it, some it, clients it, like ugly shit, right? Sell, Let's right. just put this out there. Zara, some clients you know, like it, ugly shit. In my market, I don't know. In most markets, it's this way. But in my market, listing agents sell their own listing 1% of the time. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm fortunate, but it, you know, it has a lot to do with, with our brand power mm -hmm. and, and all the hard work we do. I, I'm fortunate. I sell my own listings about 50% of the time, That's but I'm always number. very honest with clients. Yeah. I, I always tell clients very straight. I go, I, I much rather you buy this house because it's my listing. And I tell them, I said, I'm going to get paid twice, mm -hmm. but I say, don't, you know, I give them full disclosure. I go, just to let you know, this is my own listing. I would love it if you buy this. I, I already know the house inside and out. But if this is in the house for you, I have five other properties around the corner. Two of them I represent. Three of them I don't. Let's go find the one you really like. But I want to I wanna gently approach that with them mm -hmm. so they don't feel like they're being steered towards my listing. I always, you know, gently, jokingly make that full disclosure to them right away so they don't feel like, oh, well, Zar's really pushing me towards his listing because, and I always tell my go, if you don't buy this one, somebody else will, so I don't care. I always get paid regardless. Mm -hmm. I go, if you buy the other house, great. I still get paid a, a buyer's commission. If you buy this house, I'm going to get paid for the listing and somebody else is going to buy it. So don't worry about any pressure on that. But I want to make it very clear to them so they didn't go, oh, well, I, I felt like buying this house because it was your listing and I felt pushed this way. So by always approaching that, and that's before we give them a disclosure saying, hey, I represent both sides. Um, the paperwork You're comes later, saying. but Correct. the minute they step in the door, I go, by the way, this is my seller's property. Just so you know, 
I know a little bit more about this property than the one we just saw or the next one we're going to go see. But also in the so same tokens are the, the sellers hire you or us to represent the seller. You understand? So they really, that's what they hired us for, right? So, and, and we need to deliver on that. So, but, but you're, but I know you and I'm the same way and Fahad is the same thing. Um, we, we're there to protect the seller as well as the buyer at the same token. So we, dis we do disclose to them right away. Listen, this yeah. is our listing. Yes, we have a better uh, the commission rates uh, if we sell it to our own buyers. But at the end of the day, we know the product, what's here and what's available around the corner, as you just said. And this is a better house. So you're going to call me, chances are, to, to re resell this house for you. So it would be easier because I don't want to buy you something that I can't sell down the road. <laughs> But then on top of that, but, I, you know, I think on that note, the buyer is working with us yep. because we know the neighborhood. Correct. And we have traffic in the neighborhood. And if they're hiring us because we know the neighborhood, if you work the neighborhood, chances are you have a really healthy market share in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in the neighborhoods I market, I have anywhere between 15 and 60% market share. So That's huge. if you're looking at all the listings in the neighborhood, Chances are you're going to see some of my listings too. Anyways, exactly. So it, it's just a natural process, and sophisticated sophisticated buyers understand that. <laughs> I've never had an issue with it. Yeah. So people say all the time, like, "Oh my God, you keep selling your own listings," and I go, "Yeah, but I always tell the client too. If if you feel uncomfortable, I have 50 agents who work in my office. I can call any of them and go. You don't want to talk to me about the maximum you're willing to pay. You don't want me to disclose something. Talk to this person in the office." Yeah. Yeah. They'll represent you, and most of them go, no, I don't care. Like, I, I trust you. I've been working with you for so many years, or, you know, we've been working together for three weeks looking at houses every day. I don't give a shit. I want you to get the deal done. I think it's and that value once, that you portray, once right? Once a year, twice a year, they'll go, yeah, I want to I wanna tell this person in the office uh, all, all my secrets because I know you represent the seller. And <laughs> it happens, and I respect that. Yep, absolutely. I think going back to that, integrity is so important for especially the new guys joining the industry mm -hmm. there's a lot of people that are just trying to sell shit on a stick and they'll try to sell you anything find an agent that doesn't have commission breath that's a first they should not be hungry for the commission that they're going to get they should be focused on finding you the right home for yourself and for your family or the right investment an investment that makes sense and i have these conversations i had like three of these in the last week mm -hmm. where i'm getting on the phone with other people's clients other agents they're like yeah this client's looking at a 1.5 million dollar townhome uh for investment purposes that's going to rent out for 3500 dollars a month well that 1.5 million dollar townhome is going to have mortgage payments at 1.2 million mm -hmm. and then that's going to cost them like fucking eight grand mm -hmm. yeah. Are you going to make up eight grand? Where are you, are you paying the extra $4,500 yeah. yeah. out of pocket? Does it make sense as an investment? And yeah. sometimes you have to shoot it down, be honest with them. The more open and honest you are with people, the more value you provide, the more likely they are to work with you. And hence, going back to your side, the referrals, that's how you build a brand and a business. I know everyone thinks building a brand is on social media. It's really not. How you build a brand is what Zara's done. Be open, honest with your clients give them things of value that they're not getting anywhere else and when you do that they will see value in you and they'll continue to work with you would you agree Zar? absolutely i mean that's yep. that's the best way to do it and there's no such thing as over communication you just you got to communicate with your clients and that's the that's the way they keep coming back to you i mean the last thing they that you want to know is that you kept something from the client because they're going to find out the neighbor is going to go over there a week after they move in and go like, oh, can you believe, you know, you bought this house where this happened? Or can you believe you bought this house? And, you know, Zar finally sold this place that fell out of escrow eight times. And they're going to be like, Zar, the house fell out of escrow eight times. And what are you going to say? Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> it's like, you represent the house. You didn't know it fell out of escrow eight times. Why didn't you share that with me? It's like, you have to be full disclosure. Because that's how people are going to learn to trust you and, and know that you're a person of integrity. If they want the house and it's fallen out of escrow 50 times, they're still going to buy it. Mm -hmm. So there's no reason to keep something from someone because the minute you start keeping secrets from people is where you're creating doubt in their mind. And if they doubt you, they're never going to trust you and they're not going to be comfortable to, if they work with you, they're not going to feel comfortable to work with you again and again. And, and the best form of advertising is, satisfied clients that are going to work with you ever and over 
it's it's you know one of the things we preach to our agents here uh time and time again is how easy it is to have your clients give you more business because in our industry we see so many people chasing transactions or one hit and wonders we spend so much money chasing new transactions and not focusing on the clients we already have mm -hmm. who are happy to give you transactions and happy to give you their referrals over and over and it's the cheapest form of advertising when we spend so much money going after new clients and as soon as you're done with them you like wash your hands and walk away from them and you forget to keep servicing those people who've already worked with you and are happy with you if a client's happy with you keep working with them it's not done because you finished the transaction as soon as they move in they have a housewarming party and for, for six months, people keep coming over to their house and they talk about how happy they are and everything. And their friends go, oh, well, we're thinking about moving too. If you've never communicated with them, if you've never followed up with them, they forget about you so quickly. And 10 other realtors come to their house and they start talking to them and start moving with them. They start giving that agent's name and information. But if you are always moving with them and always following up with them and going, hey, how did the house work out? The, the one broken cabinet, you want me to send somebody over, they know that you're invested into their future and their happiness. They're going to keep talking about you with their friends continuously, and they're going to they're gonna keep referring you. And before you know it, four or five leads come from that one satisfied client Absolutely. while you're out there chasing new people who don't know you, who you have to build a rapport with, and you just become a transactional broker versus a relationship broker. That's exactly right. That's that's exactly right. So, Zar, I want to go to the uh, all the good stories because this is what uh, really, really exciting. So far, it's been absolutely amazing. But I want to go and talk about you. You just touched on it as well a little bit. You said Michael Jackson made your career. So, um, I, you've been in the industry. So you did the internship, you really loved the whole environment of, of real estate. And it's, look, look you're, it's in your blood, right? You can tell. So what happened when you really got that uh, change happen and the momentum you built? And, on, and how did that come about? And what really uh, transpired you to become the superstar and the mogul that you are as, as an entrepreneur and, and uh, owner of the agency in, in Las Vegas and so on and so forth and your multiple restaurants. So, But it started from that little trigger in life, right? Yeah, Am I the, right? The struggle, the luxury real estate aspect and then taking you into Michael Jackson, oh, that yeah. blew you up. Yeah, yeah. So really like that struggle a for a couple questions. of years. <laughs> you started your own brokerage at one point in time, I believe. Um, I, I did a little bit of research, so a lot of research, actually. <laughs> uh, I like to look people up, figure out exactly what they've done, watch every interview you've ever had, read everything about you that's online. So that's where we want to go. Struggle to real estate, uh, luxury real estate, and then the MJ story and what transpired after that. After the MJ. Yeah. So give us the goods. Yeah, I mean, the, the struggle is, you know, I think everything good comes from comes from a struggle or anything you you've really earned and and you've worked hard for comes from struggle. I mean, a lot of people are are handed things and then you don't really appreciate them and you don't understand how, how fortunate you've been. But, uh, you know, I I was very fortunate to get some opportunities. Uh, and I always say, you know, I, I always say I got lucky. Um, and you but do. you didn't. You no, do no, no. Lucky. But you didn't. You really, really worked hard. Like, like I know, I know you. But for the audience, don't know you. You don't, don't downplay it. I, I, <laughs> we don't downplay that at all. So, so tell us what was the, the you know, the, the leases that you could. You know, I want to hear that. So everybody understands that. Yeah, today you got to where you are today. But when you start, usually. You don't start at the top, you know, so, so and yeah, everybody wants to, and everybody Especially wants to in this Instagram world uh, and in the world of like the Kardashians where everybody's like, oh, I just, I just want to post a video and I just want to go into like the $10 million houses and that's what I want to sell. Like, ew, I don't want to sell a $300,000 condo. Like that's not cute. And you get messages um, on Instagram. I get messages on Instagram. Hey, how did you get to luxury? How can I get to luxury? Like that's the question they ask you. How do you get to yeah. luxury? It's like, okay, there's, it's like a recipe. I say, okay, so here's the recipe. This is what you got to do first. No, there's, there's no such a thing. They think that overnight it just fall into our laps. So that's, <laughs> 
I thought you were born on the bridal path. (laughs) I was washing dishes, buddy, for five dollars an hour when I came. You know that. So, anyways, yeah, all we knew. I mean, the struggle is the struggle is real, and it takes a long time. I mean, it took me six years probably before I sold my first seven-figure house, and I'm not talking about like eight million dollars. I'm talking about like a million dollars mm-hmm. uh, and it took so long and so much hard work and so much ass kissing. But, you know, when, when I finished high school, you know, my mom was a professor mm-hmm. and, and, you know, like, you know, Asian mothers, Middle Eastern mothers, it's like, if, if you don't, if you don't go and, and become an attorney, an engineer, a doctor, <laughs> you're a huge freaking failure. failure. <laughs> it's like, you're an embarrassment. Yeah. If you come home with like an A minus, you should get slapped in the face and, and get grounded in your room. It's oh, like, yeah. you've screwed it up. It's not grounded. You got, that, you got an ass kick. Right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I yeah. mean, you like 97% didn't get like, grounded. what happened to the other? Where'd, <laughs> where'd you leave that? Like. You couldn't find another three points? Like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, you know, I look at kids now who whose parents are like, oh, you got a participation trophy. Like, good job. I'm like, where was that when I was growing up? It was like, you suck. We got so many ass um, <laughs> Biggest load of fucking bullshit yeah. that's out there, by the way, participation trophies. Yeah. Take that shit away. Your kid either won or they lost. And if they lost, yeah. it's a good fucking lesson to them. Stop telling them that. Absolutely. Like, that's what they need to know. That's life. I mean, that's what that's what makes you hungry. That's what makes you ambitious, I think, mm-hmm. is like not being told like you did great. Good job for trying. I'm like trying, you know. <laughs> you don't you don't get shit for trying. You like you win, there's one winner. Mm-hmm. Like you either won or you lost. Like yeah. that's it. <laughs> Have you seen that so, video where it's like I'm, if your dad uh tells you that great job for participation, your dad's a fucking loser. Because <laughs> there's winners <laughs> and they're losers. And we're going out there, yeah. we're gonna try to win. And win, and this goes back to the Ed Milet thing. Winning is more fun than fun is fun. Yeah. So go try yeah, to yeah. win. Yep. Back to you. Go for it. Yeah. When I when I was in boot camp, it was like you're either running or you're dropping to the floor. And if you're dropping to the floor, you're doing push-ups. Mm. And you know, I still have scars on the palm of my hands from you know this is like Marines and and they're drunken Marines. When you had to do push-ups, it wasn't like, oh, let me just do push-ups. Like, over the weekend, those guys were drinking beers and cracking bottles. So when you did push-ups, it was like broken pieces of glass oh, everywhere. Wow. Mm. So you're getting broken glass in your hand. And if you drop down and and stop doing it, they say drop down and give me 25. And at 23 push-ups, you break and you fall down because the glass is piercing your hand. You got to do 25 more push-ups. And if you can't do it, it's like, okay, now you're going to have to run an extra three miles wow. until you vomit. And if you stop running, it's, it's like, it's constant punishment. So it's not like, oh, well, good job. You participated. You did five push-ups, and now you got to go to the nurse's office. There's no nurse's office. Like, you get kicked out. Like, it, it, it just sucks. But that's that's the reality of life. Life's going to kick you in the ass constantly. That's right. It's when we go up for a listing appointment, the homeowner doesn't go, well, here's a participation, you know, 1%, but we're going to get the listing to somebody else. It's like, uh, no, they tell you, like, get the hell out of my house. We gave the listing to the other guy and you got zero. Like, yep. you get no listing. Get out. Yep. Absolutely. And then you get to see somebody else on social media go, look at my new listing. It, it's mine. It's an exclusive listing. You suck. And then somebody else sells it. So there's no participation points in real life. No. But no, I mean, my, my, uh, that, that goes back to like how I started. My struggle was, was real. It's, you know, my mom was, was very much like very liberal compared to most Persian parents, Mm -hmm. but, but there was a lot of pressure there. It was like, okay, now, now you have to go to a university and get a degree. And I, and I was determined to be a cop and, and be successful in real estate. So when I was 18, uh, I said, well, I'm going to get a real estate license and I want to give this a go. And she said, no, she's like, that, it takes like two weeks, you know, to get a real estate license in the U S <laughs> she's like, that's, that's not a career. That's like, that's what you do we from like a prison work release program. <laughs> like you get out of prison and, and you go to, you go to a real estate course. Like that, that's not a real thing. And I was like, no, I want to give it a go. And she made it so unrealistic for me. She said, okay, if, if you want to take a gap year, you can take a gap year, but you're going to have to prove to me that in this gap year, 
you're going to be able to make a hundred thousand dollars and then you can, you can stay in real estate. Wow. Okay. And I'm like a hundred thousand dollars when you're 18. I'm like, first of all, you're like that. That's, that's an insane that's a amount lot of, money. of money. Yeah. So I, I was like, okay, fine. If it, cause I've always hated school. Yeah. I mean, I've always been a kid who did not enjoy going to school I, I was shockingly uh, a straight C student because I never went to school. I never did my homework. I always ditched class. And the last couple of weeks in school when they told me, hey, you're failing, you're going to get kicked out and you can't do all the extra credit things you do. You can't do after school sports. You can't be in the in the police department, you know, junior cop uh, program that you're in. You can't do all these things unless you have at least a C average. I would go to the teacher and I was like, hey, girl. What do we need to do to get a C? And she's like, you need to turn in all this homework. You need to do extra credit. You need to do all these things. So in the last two weeks, I would turn in all the homework I had to do to at least get a C average. And I would negotiate my way to a C. <laughs> and they're like, all right, you've got a C. You've got a C. And I was like, all right, we've got a C. I get to at least do all the after school sports and I get to do all the after school activities I want to do. And the police department will be happy with me. So I'm good to go. And I would just keep moving forward. And, and I finished school a year and a half ahead of schedule, but with a medium average just to get through everything. Got it. So when I turned 18, I got my, my real estate license and I went to work every day. I was probably every morning, the first person in the office. I was there between 6.30 and seven o'clock every morning. Amazing. And I was always every single night, the last person to leave the office. I would not leave the office until every single thing on my checklist was completely crossed off. I would not leave anything for, for the next day. And that meant I would miss every party. I would miss mm -hmm. every birthday. I would miss every gathering. I didn't care what I had to miss. I was super focused on work. Mm -hmm. And in nine months or so, I had made, I think it was something like five, $6,000 I had made. And, and I was realizing that uh, it, it was, shit was getting real. I might not be getting to my goal. And in the last two and a half months of the year, all the little seeds I had planted, all the things I was doing started coming to fruition. Mm -hmm. And I barely made over $100,000 because everything that I had planned for nine months ahead finally came to be. And by the end of the year, I made just barely over $100,000. And I told my mom, I was like, look, you had your I made 100K. <laughs> I get to do this for one more year. And she's like, fine. Next year, you have to do more than the year before. And same deal. And for maybe three years, every year we had this deal where she's like, shit, he keeps, he keeps doing a little <laughs> bit more. So I got to avoid going to a university for three, four years. And eventually, and first of all, when you're like 18, 19 years old and you make a hundred K, you're like, I'm so fucking rich. I was like, it, baby. I bought a car and I was like, I bought a house and I was like, I am rich, bitch. <laughs> I was like, I bought a house and I bought a car. And then I was like, next year I'm going to buy a boat. And then I was like, now I'm going to buy a You don't realize like, first of all, you've got taxes, you've got all this shit you got to pay. When you you give an 18 year old a hundred K you're like, I am the richest bitch around. And then you're like, Oh, Fuck, like when you work for yourself, they don't take the taxes off that check. You're like, they knock on the door and they're like, uh, sweetie, we're going to need like half of that. <laughs> and you're like, fuck, I got to go back to work and make more money to now just pay all the money I made back. <laughs> so I kept doing that. And then every year I kept making more and more and more and more. And at some point my mom was like, all right, you love what you're doing. You're happy. Everybody else that were her, like her cousin's kids, we're like in their third or fourth year of med school. There were like a hundred, two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars in student loan debt, yeah. and they were miserable. And she's like, "Okay, fine. You're you're buying, you know, your second investment property. You're buying your third investment property. You're happy. You you realize you're not rich. <laughs> you you're paying your bills. You're paying your taxes. You're investing well, and I'm happy and I'm proud of you. And and you know, just went from a hundred thousand to a couple hundred thousand." to eventually I started making seven figures and I've been very happy to do that, but I never was able to break the threshold and, and get into, get into the million dollar price point. I mm -hmm. went from selling investment properties to, to helping restaurant owners uh, buy franchises. I went from working for a corporate commercial company mm -hmm. to working for franchise owners uh, of these restaurant companies by their own independent locations 
I ended up working for a lot of investors. And some of those franchise owners of these restaurants were very successful people, people who owned a dozen, two dozen restaurant locations. And I thought, great, they're the kind of people who are going to buy multi-million dollar homes from me. But I was 21 years old. So they're mm -hmm. looking at me. They're like, hey, you were really good at this thing. You were really good at helping us find three rental properties, but we don't trust you to go out and find mm -hmm. us a three million dollar house in a country club. You don't have any experience in that. So I I hunkered down and I started learning everything I needed to learn. I started learning everything about interior decorators, the country club, like what hole is this? What what is who designed this golf course? Who are the architects who are building these homes? Who are the general contractors who are mm -hmm. building these homes? What style of uh, home is this? I started learning everything I needed to learn. And eventually I got recruited by the number one luxury brokerage in, in Vegas. Amazing. And I thought, well, this is it. Like, you know, this company is by invitation only. They recruit the top agents. And I still wasn't getting clients. I started selling seven, eight, nine hundred thousand dollar homes. But six years into the business, I still hadn't sold a million dollar home. And wow. the, the company I was working at was uh, was looking for somebody to help run the office. So I became the manager of, of the company and uh, I was still selling a lot. And I was, you know, I was in my early 20s. I had the respect of all my colleagues, but everybody was 50 plus years old. They were extremely successful. And here I am, you know, helping run the office and they have multiple locations in Vegas. I'm in charge. And, uh, and I'm still too stupid to realize, you know, I can learn everything, I can know everything. But the one missing piece of the puzzle for me was I didn't know that a lot of the business had to do with who you know, not exactly what you know. I just figured if I know everything, I'm going to get the business. Mm -hmm. But I didn't realize at some point it has a lot to do with who you know and where you're associated and I was finally in a firm that that was representing the right clients and that had all the connections. And I started surrounding myself with these people. I call them the first wife's club. <laughs> it was like all, all these women who were married to developers and architects and were members of the country club. And then they started saying, hey, you know, my husband's out of town or uh, he he's not able to join me. Can you join me for a charity dinner? And it's like a $5,000 a chair seat or a $10,000 table at a charity event. And then I started meeting all the right people. And once they start talking real estate, it's like, oh, my neighbor's thinking of selling their home. And now I immediately know, oh, you live in this country club. You're in this street. You're next to the house that this person built three years ago. And that's, you know, this beautiful home that this architect built. It's the one with the balcony in the front and it's got the beautiful cypress mm -hmm. trees. And they're like, oh, wow, well, did you know sell that? it? You know. I go, oh, no, but this person at our firm sold it. So all these things started happening, but they were still not trusting me to do it because I didn't have the resume. And that's when that's when the famous email came from my <laughs> from my Nigerian prince, the spam email. Yeah. So I'm sitting in the office one day and as as the manager, I, I get a lot of the emails I'm CC'd on on the general inbox for for the office and an email comes in. And it says, hey, you know, I'm so-and-so, not the real name, obviously. I live in a castle. Uh, I live in a castle in Ireland. And I'm interested in this, like, 17,000 square foot humongous house. <laughs> and I want to know all these things about this property. Is You know, does it have a panic room? What kind of alarm system? How high are the walls? Like, all these security questions that to most well-experienced people, they'd be like, get the hell out of here. You're, you're <laughs> going to rob this house. Or you're asking <laughs> you want a floor plan questions. to see if you can rob this place, okay? <laughs> Literally. Uh, so me being an idiot and not having any experience, I'm like, and this is quite a few years ago, so I'm like, let me print the floor plan, draw a circle around where the panic room is hidden, scan it, and then email it back to you, a person that I have no idea who you are. And I respond and I'm like, here's how the panic room is. Here's how you access. Here's oh all the God. stuff. And then I tell the agents in the office, I was like, hey, we have a lead on this property. Who wants it? And everybody who's, you know, very successful in the office looks at me and they're like, you're an idiot. This they're is like, this is a fake lead. This is a scam <laughs> artist. This is somebody who's either going to rob the house or somebody who's going to ask you for money, they're like, we don't want this lead. This is worthless. And I was like, 
but we can't ignore a client. And they're like, Zar, take your lead and shove it. And I was like, <laughs> okay, well, I, I respond to the email. I wait a couple of days. Nobody still wants this lead. So I'm like, well, we can't ignore a good lead. And everybody's like, it's not a good lead. It's, <laughs> it's crap. So I engage with this person and it ends up being like, I don't know, nine, 10 months of conversation. Wow. Where it's, you know, a little bit of real estate talk like, oh, you know, what are you eating tonight? And I was like, uh, well, I'm still at the office. I forgot to eat dinner, so I'm eating a Twix bar. So this is all this through email. Like, oh, I love Twix. Yeah, email all or text? Email oh, and, all email. No, this is this is before text was really a thing. Right. Uh, so no phone conversations. No, okay, and I I am. Am. no ahead. phone conversation. And, you I don't, am, yeah. and you still don't know who this person is. You think there's just somebody with a fake name, a buyers are interested in you and yeah. also some properties. Okay. At what point in time in well, those like I 10 always... months did you feel like maybe this is real or maybe this person's just lingering me on? Because after a while, with even some buyers, you may be like, especially if you haven't met them and they're asking you all these questions, what the hell's going on? Yeah. Well, no, I mean, you know, I, everybody in the office told me it's fake. And I'm like, yeah, it probably is. But I always have this attitude. I even tell the agents in the office today mm -hmm. when they get something and they're not sure, I'm like, well, what's the harm in meeting the person once? Mm -hmm. Like, I'm like, if somebody reaches out and they're like, well, this person said this and it was a red flag. I mean, if it's a dangerous situation, I'm like, two of you go or I'll go with you mm -hmm. or, you know, let's explore it. But I'm like, just think of it as a dress rehearsal. Mm -hmm. You're going to show your listing anyways. You're going to, you need practice showing this listing. So I'm like, take a chance and go out. And so often people are like, oh, well, you know, this person showed up in like an old car. Like, you know, they're looking at this, this like $10 million listing. I expect them to pull up in a Bentley. And I'm like, you know how many like super expensive homes I've shown to like a guy in an old truck. I've sold to I'm some like, celebrities you know how many, too, same thing. <laughs> you know how many rich dudes drive an old truck? Yeah. Like I sold a house to like one of the most famous actors, a guy with m many Oscars. He loves an old truck. He <laughs> rolls up in an old truck. Like that's his jam. Like there's so many stories of like, don't judge a book by its cover. That's that sounds right. so cliche, mm -hmm. but I'm like, dudes in old true. trucks are the ones who are like, can I give you a check? The guy in the Bentley is like the one who's like, I'll send you a wire. And then the mortgage company calls and they're like, Never uh, he's not qualified right now. We're a little overextended. And uh, and then the Bentley's on a lease. And I'm like, oh, crap. Like, oh, God. This guy is blowing everything. The guy in the old truck is like, I'll just write you a check for it. Like, you know, and, and and I'll give you a million extra for the furniture. And you're like, all right, for the old truck. Let's go. <laughs> so so I always tell people, I'm like, just give it a minute. Take a chance on it. So that's what I was doing. Mm -hmm. I was pretty sure it wasn't legitimate because I'm like, who is going to buy a 17,000 square foot house? And they're like, what are you doing tonight? And I'm like, just eating a Twix bar. And then the IM pops up. I love Twix. And I was like, yeah. Great. <laughs> you know, cookie in the middle. And they're like, uh, you know, what are you doing? I'm like, oh, I'm just going to go home and hang out with the dogs and watch the housewives tonight. And he's like, what's that? You know, just just like nonsense and a right little bit course. childish. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, after many months, it's like, hey, is that one house with the panic room still available? And I'm like, yep, still there. You know, didn't go anywhere. And it was like, I'll take it. And I was like, take it. What do you mean I'll take it? And they're like. I'll take it. What do I need to do? And I was like, well, you got to, you got to wire $500,000 to escrow. How much was the price? And they're like, that okay. Has? Sorry. How much Let was me the know. price? 8 million bucks. 8 million bucks. Okay. Okay. So, which, on. you know, I, Back that then. was like a ridiculous number to me. Yeah. So I, I, the next day I email wire instructions and everybody in the office laughed at me. They're like, yeah, that, that money is going to bounce or like, it's going to show up and then they're going to ask you to wire like money back to them and then you're going to get scammed. And I was like, well, great. I don't have that much money. So if they ask me to send something back to them, <laughs> jokes on them because that shit's going to bounce right back. I was like, they're going to bounce a check and I'm going to bounce one right back to them. So the, they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, we'll send you the money. And I was like, great. So the wire comes in and I'm like, but did it clear? And the escrow company is like, yeah. 
Yeah, oh, shit. cleared. Mm -hmm. uh, I was like, should we wait? So I wait a couple of days. Nothing happens. I called the escrow company back. And I was like, the money is still there. They're like, yeah, 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 yeah. There's a, uh, there's a million bucks here. And I was like, a million. <laughs> uh, they're like, yeah. How much did you ask for? I said, 500,000. They go, oh no, they sent a million and the money's good. It's cleared. It's sitting in the account. Wow. So I emailed them. I was like, Hey, uh, got your wire. It's, it's for a little more than you said. And more than what I asked for. They're like, oh yeah, we want to make sure you got it. And we sent some extra because we're going to need your help making sure that the house is ready. So we just want you to get, you know, mattresses and TVs and get the house ready because we At don't At that have point, to get you still things. don't know who you're talking to. You still have no, no idea. Okay. All right. No, but now I'm like, oh, shit got real. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> this is something okay. real. Then the person I'm talking to says, my assistant's going to call you and line everything up. So I go, great. He's like, okay, they'll call you like at this time on this day. And I'm sitting by the phone and the phone rings and I answer the phone. It's like, oh, hi, Zar. And they refer to the person as the client. Mm -hmm. So I was like, oh, okay, well, the client. So I answered, hi, Zar. You know, the client's really excited to meet you. The client said you've been wonderful to talk to recently and you've been so helpful. And, you know, can you write a few things down? And I said, absolutely. She goes, well, I'm going to give you the client's uh, tail number because we want you to pick us up at the airport. And I said, oh, great. Okay, well, what's your flight number? And she goes, uh, okay, Zar, I already gave you the tail number. And I go, uh-huh, I have no idea what a tail number is. So I'm like, uh, that's great. What's the flight number? And she goes, Zar, I have a lot of information to go through. We don't have time for jokes. And I go, okay, uh, great. Do you want to give me the flight number? She's like, I already gave you the tail number. So let's oh, move that's on. That's amazing. Like, that's hilarious. I was like, okay, well, we're not playing. This bitch is this bitch is going for it. So I was like, okay. Fine. And she's like, well, we're we're gonna arrive around this time. You'll be clear to come pick us up. She goes, he's very excited to meet you. So just come up to the plane and he'll get in the car with you. And the rest of us are gonna get in a couple of uh, SUVs behind you. Just wait for us. As soon as everything's loaded, then you, we'll follow you to the house. We want you to do this and this. And she gives me all the instructions. And I'm like, okay, great. Do um, you have that flight number? And she's like, Zar, you know who the client is, uh, right? And I go, yeah, of course. And she goes, Zar, do you know who the client is? <laughs> and I go, yeah, of course I do. And she goes on and tells me a few more things. And then she goes, well, Zar, the client's really excited to meet you. And uh, since you're you're familiar with everything, you know, I need you to make sure you practice all the discretion like you have the last few months. And she goes, but you know, you know, the client is Michael Jackson. And I go, uh, yeah, of course I knew the client is Michael Jackson. <laughs> oh, Meanwhile, my God. Like, oh. Holy shit. <laughs> Goosebumps. Holy like shit. Now I just want to get off the phone with her. Now I'm just She's like, screaming. What now I'm like, this fuck? is a joke. It's a lie. Like, I was like, now I'm like, this whole time, oh it's God. been a really mean joke. I'm like, this is an episode of Punk. I'm like, looking around, I'm like, who has been the fucking cameras? with me this whole time? <laughs> Ashton like, Kutcher is going to jump out. Ever. <laughs> because I, I don't, like, care that much about celebrities. But, like, as a kid who grew up in the 80s, there were only, like, three famous people in my head. It's like... Prince, Michael Jackson, and Madonna, and that's it. Yeah. Everybody else doesn't matter. <laughs> so I was like, so I hang up the phone with her, and I was like, okay, what? I was like, this can't be real. Now I'm retracing everything in my head, and I'm like, could it be? I was like, I mean, some of the conversation, like, I'm like, maybe. And I'm thinking, like, trying to piece things together. And then I go to Google, and I was like, what the fuck is a tail number? <laughs> And then I was like, oh my God, that's what, I was like, no wonder this bitch doesn't have a flight number for me. I was like, that's a tail. I was like, cause when she said like, just drive up to the plane, I was like, this bitch is crazy. I was like, I was like, and then I was like, how am I going to figure out their flight number? And she's cause she's like, oh, we'll arrive around like this time. And I was like, you don't know when you're arriving. That's when I was like, None of this makes sense. And I already asked like three times and she's like, we don't have time for jokes. And I was like, this ain't no joke, lady. <laughs> so I was like, okay. And sure enough, I went to the private terminal at the airport. Nobody talked to me. I just pushed the button 
and the gate opened and I was like, oh, oh my shit. God, I'm on the freaking runway. <laughs> and next thing I knew, like the plane landed and then this huge black man like had this little man in his arms like a baby. The door to my car opened and they put him in the passenger seat and there's Michael sitting next to me in the car and he was like, oh, hi. And I was like, uh, oh my hi. God. And he was like, it's so great to finally meet you. And he's talking to me like normal. Like we were just IMing each other at, you know, at 12 o'clock at Jesus. night. So he's sitting in front of, he's in the front seat of your car. So you're what? driving he's or you have a chauffeur? Are, were, you were you driving? Were you driving? Yeah, I'm in the driver's seat of my car and he's in the passenger seat of my car. And then I look in the oh rear view mirror God. and they're like, people are loading up luggage and they're getting in these black Suburbans oh. and it's like normal. Oh. And then it's time to go. So I drive to the house, I show him his house. Everything looks great. And then he's like, what's for dinner? And I was like, I didn't make dinner. What do you mean what's for dinner? And he's like, oh, well, are you going to stay for dinner? And I was like, um, okay. Sure. And he's like, well, what should we get? And I was like, uh, we can go to Whole Foods. We can go. So we picked up dinner. I came home. We had dinner. And then he's like, do you want to come back tomorrow? Oh. So I came back. And, and when you're Michael Jackson, I don't know this, but when you're Michael Jackson, you don't get mail. Like mm -hmm. you don't get mail at home because then the mailman, the UPS guy could be like, oh, I know who lives here. And they can, you know, tell everybody, tell the paparazzi. So Michael was like, well, since I like you and I trust you, can I have my mail go to you? And then every day or every couple of days you come over and bring it over. And I was like, uh, that means we're going to hang out every day. And he's like, yeah, just come over. Wow. So that's what happened. I would go over every day, every other day and drop off the mail. And then we became friends. I would take the mail over there and then he'd be like, do you want to watch this with me? Do you know what happened today? And we started this amazing relationship and, and a great friendship where he was like, oh, next week is Christmas. Do you want to come over? Oh next God. week is this is happening. Or tomorrow night I'm going out to dinner with this person. You should join me. And it became this long friendship and a beautiful relationship where I spent every birthday, every holiday, every milestone event with him. And Amazing. and eventually one day he's like, um, Zar, are you are you poor? <laughs> and I said, uh, no, Michael, I'm I'm very successful for my age. He's like, you are? And I was like, uh, yeah. He's I like, I'm, I'm poor compared to you, though, Michael. <laughs> Everyone's well, poor compared to Michael. I mean, but again, I was like, I make six figures. And he must have been like, six figures? Like, that's it? <laughs> but in my mind, I was like, bitch, I'm like... Of all my friends, I'm the richest bitch around. And I was like, I make six figures, huh? And he must have been like, six figures? Like, that's not even a month. That's like less than a week's worth of income here. And he was like, six figures? So I was like, yeah, I'm fine. I, I'm rich, bitch. I make six figures. And he was like, oh, oh. okay. And I was like, uh, why? And he was like, well, you know, when when I came by your office, like, everybody's car is a little bit nicer. And oh I was like, God. I was like, I mean, I was like, Michael, everybody in my office is like 60. I'm like 20. I was like, I mean, they've all been doing this longer. And he's like, well, can I help you? I was like, no, I don't want money. I don't want, it. he's like, oh, I was like, no, I'm, I'm fine. I was like, he's like, well, I've known you for so long now. I want to like, you know, can I do anything? I was like, no, I was like, only thing I would ever ask for from you is like, you know, if you have any friends or clients or anybody who needs a house, just let me know. I'd be happy to help them. He was like, oh, yeah. He's like, you know, I love real estate. I talk real estate all the time. If somebody needs anything, I'll tell them you're my guy and I trust you and I love you. And I was like, wow, I love you, too. So I don't know. A little while later, he one day lets me know. He's like, um, I have a I have this girl who's coming here. She's a friend. She's a young girl and she's going to need a house. And I was like, great. And I thought this is like a nanny, somebody who like he's hiring. So he's like, she's going to give you a call. And I said, great. So I'm waiting for a call. And sure enough, I get a phone call. And they're like, hey, uh, I got your number from Michael. He mentioned you are great and you can help me. And I'm talking to this person and the voice sounds a little familiar. 
and it's Britney Spears. Oh, did she my say God. it's Britney, and bitch? Like, it's Britney. <laughs> <laughs> shit it, like oh that oh my god Britney bitch it's Britney bitch <laughs> and I'm like well that makes sense wow. that that's his friend but I'm literally expecting like oh I need a rental I need like a $200,000 condo I'm gonna be working in Michael's house uh, and it's Britney my and god. of course like if you can be trusted by Michael and you keep his secret and you you can earn his business, then why wouldn't Britney want to reach out? But you were so, more than that. I'm just going to interrupt you for one second because I know the story a little bit, so I, wanted, I want the audience to hear this. Uh, you were more than that to Michael. You were just not uh, his realtor or somebody that he referred people to you. Like, I know the story that you took Paris to, and, and, and uh, little Michael uh, to grocery shopping. So tell, I want to know that relationship between both of you. How did that bond, bond so deeply that he trusted you so much with so many different stuff? Uh, so, so give us a little bit about that too, Zar. Yeah, I mean, Michael was... Uh you know, Michael was a person who's hard to get close to and and has been, his trust um, has been abused mm -hmm. so often by the people around him. Absolutely. Um, and he's hard to get close to because he's got so many, um, so many protectors around him. And and I, I broke through that because we bonded without me knowing who he was. He was just mm -hmm. an anonymous person online that I I conversated with openly and, and about nonsense. Like, what are you doing? I'm watching the housewives. What are you doing? I'm eating a Twix bar. You know, by the way, do you have a question about this? What's this neighborhood? And I'm like, oh, that's a shit neighborhood. Don't go there. Don't even look there. Mm -hmm. You know, just, just very honest, frank conversation. Like you would be talking to, you know, a friend of yours. Like you'd be talking to your neighbor. So, uh, and then... Uh, I was also not afraid of the people around him and I didn't play, play, play that game. You know, when, when some of the people around him who didn't want people to get close to him played games, I, I would, I would not be afraid because I wasn't on his payroll. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there were times in Vegas in the summer when it's like 110 degrees, I'd go to the house and the door's locked and I know the code to the gate. So I come in the gate, I'm out the door, the door's locked. And I've got, you know, a UPS package. I've got mail there. And security's like, oh, he's taking a nap uh, just a minute. And I'm waiting outside and 20, 30 minutes go by. Wow. And I'm like, it's 110 fucking degrees. Somebody opened the door. And then Michael's just like on his way to the fridge and sees me outside, opens the door. He's like, what are you doing outside? I'm like, uh, security said you're taking a nap. He's like, no, I'm not. And then he's like, who the hell left Zara outside? He's, he's family. Open the door. And they're like, oh, sorry, we thought you were napping. They're not. They just mm -hmm. want me to stop coming around because I'm the person who's like, you know, calling people out. I'm the mm -hmm. person who would be like, Michael, why did you just give that person 800 bucks? And he's like, oh, they went to the grocery store to get a few uh, a few things. And I was like, what did they get? And he's like, oh, they got milk and cereal. And I was like, Michael, how much does milk and cereal cost? And he's like, I don't know, 800 bucks. And I was like, Michael what kind of fucking milk and cereal are you getting for the kids? And he's like, uh, whole milk. And I was like, unless you bought a fucking cow, uh, milk is not $800. And he's like, it's not. And I was like, Michael, but when's the last time Michael wow, drove down to the grocery store to buy milk? So I could have told him milk cost $8,000 and he would have been like, here you go. <laughs> like right. when people would take advantage of him, nobody would say anything because all everybody would take advantage. So when I'd be like, Michael, you need to fire this person who takes advantage of you. He's like, no, if I fire them, who am I going to replace them with? And I was like, if you don't fire them, what else are they going to take advantage of? I was like, tomorrow, they'll go to the press and sell a story about you. I was like, so fire them. And he would get so mad and the people around them would hate me. But they're like, eventually, Michael would be like, okay, fine, I need to fire them. I was like, yeah, fucking get rid of these people. Because if you can't trust somebody to be honest with you about how much they spent at the grocery store. You can't trust them about anything else. Mm -hmm. So his staff hated those things about me. But every time I would do some, some of those things that were second nature to me, he, he somehow realized more and more like, okay, 
like we trusted are. Mm-hmm. So the most precious thing to Michael, the, the, the thing that was closest to his heart that meant the most to his world were his three children. Mm-hmm. So he would never go out in public with them because of the scrutiny and, and everything, all the backlash that would come from that. And that's why whenever he was out in public with his children, their faces were covered, mm-hmm. which I know people, you know, people uh, were upset about that. But literally, I've been in the car with him where everything is normal. Like if I was in the car with you and then from the car to the front door of the restaurant or wherever we would go, the kids would cover their faces for security reasons uh, and to remain somewhat anonymous. And as soon as we go in the building, they're not covered anymore. Mm-hmm. So that's when they're with Michael. If if kids go with me somewhere, you don't know what they look like and I don't get any attention. So they would be perfectly fine. And if if security would follow, you know, 500 feet behind us, it doesn't look, you know, suspicious. Mm-hmm. Or I don't even know sometimes. I, I think I went out with his kids without any security following me because he was okay with that. Uh, I don't know that for sure, but I know there were a couple of occasions where where Michael finally felt uh, comfortable and he said, yeah, you guys can go out with with Czar. And uh, I believe I'm the first person who ever took his kids to to a Walmart and his kids (laughs) didn't know what the hell a Walmart is. So we go to Walmart to buy. I think it was like around um, Prince Michael or, or everybody calls him blanket around blankets birthday. And we go to Walmart to buy, uh, I think it was a Spider-Man toy. He was obsessed with Spider-Man at the toy uh, at the time. And we go into Walmart and the kids could not believe there's a store that sells toys, pajamas, <laughs> cake, all these things. And everything's like $10, $20. And they're like, what? what? They're like, we can buy cake and snacks and toys. I was like, uh, yeah, kids, buy whatever the hell you want. You can buy the and we come out of there <laughs> and like 150 bucks. Oh, wow. And and they go home and they're like, Daddy, Zor took us to this place where we got a cake and Spider-Man toys and we got a balloon. And we and I was like, and I spent 150 bucks, bitch. Like, that's it. <laughs> you know, same place where milk costs $800. We got all this shit for about 150 bucks. Oh, so, I mean, God. we really had a very trusting relationship. So that's why when when another celebrity would, would call and say, hey, I'm coming to Vegas or I'm going to start a residency or, or, you know, they're out to dinner and they say, Michael, I'm thinking about taking this job in Vegas or I just need a home in Vegas he'd say, talk to Czar. Yep. You know, he he's he's the member of our family. Like just, you know, Incredible. hit him up. He he won't screw you over. And and that that means the world to me because that's why I say he built my career. Because, you know, first it was, you know, Brittany. Mm-hmm. And then it's, you know, hey, um, I have a friend. She's a little much. She's a good girl, but she she's gonna put you through the ringer. You know, wait till she gives you a call. And I'm thinking, okay, it's like a producer's wife or somebody else. And I get a phone call and it's Mariah Carey. Wow. And I was like, oh my God. (laughs) Uh, You know, and and then it's like when you work with people who are bigger than life and have these reputations of like, you know, a Michael, a Mariah, a Britney, then next thing that happens is, you know, companies like Caesars Palace and MGM and these places reach out to you and they go, hi, Zar, it's, you know, the CEO or the head of entertainment for this hotel or this casino property. And we know that you work with this person and that person. We want to let you know when we're hiring, you know, Elton John, where we're hiring this person, we need you to help us with their residential needs. Or, you know, we have a new executive who's starting at the company and his wife and children are going to be in town while he's interviewing. Can you please take them out? Or, you know, we have a we have a client who gambles, you know, millions of dollars, uh, but they're very high maintenance. We rather they uh, find a mansion to live in for a few months Ooh. instead of staying at the property. Uh, but they're really high maintenance. Uh, and you go, well, they can't be more high maintenance than these people who have these world renowned reputations for being the biggest divas in the world. Mm -hmm. When in reality, some of those people, it's just a reputation. They're, they're normal celebrities and they're normal people to work with, but the reputation's there. So, so you just become the person that the properties reach out to. 
and and you become known as as the realtor to the stars. Incredible. And and then of course with that comes comes press and and television. And there's so many people that I can mention like the Michael who for years nobody knew he and I were friends and nobody knew he and I were seeing each other constantly and and then he says run with it, you know, use my name to your advantage and and build yourself a reputation and a career. Who was that? And then there's people who to this day I've never mentioned I worked with because they're like nobody needs to know I bought a home in Vegas. Mm -hmm. Uh or or I don't need, you know, fans knowing. I don't want, you know, my ex to know. <laughs> and you know, I always say I have a really big mouth. Um when when it's time to have a big mouth or there's celebrities who are like I want everybody to know I bought a $20 million dollar home in Vegas. So talk about it on TV. Call Amazing. TMZ. And I'm like, I don't have the number for TMZ. They're like, don't worry. <laughs> we'll give it I'll to you. I'll call TMZ we'll and they'll call <laughs> you. And I'm like, okay, great. <laughs> so, and then we have clients who go, zip it. And I'm like, for every one celebrity that you've heard a million stories about, I have two celebrities that you're never ever going to hear a word about. Got it. So can you tell us just I I would love to first of all get your Rolodex. That's what I want to know. <laughs> so if you get a hold of Zars phone, you know, listen, you'll be making uh, billions of dollars. But but that's people not going to happen. People people have. Have. And the so, great thing is so many people are saved under things you would never, never guess. Never know. Exactly. Yeah, so, it's like <laughs> they're saved under things that only I would know. So let me ask you something. Who can you mention that you've represented? Do you do do you Can you mention some people, some names? Safely, we know safely. safely. So uh, not, that you're we would never want you to yeah, mention somebody, someone. That... Somebody that I often forget, like I'm watching TV and I was like, oh, that person, we sold them a house. <laughs> I mean, just just recently, uh, we we just uh, recently, some of the ones that are public knowledge, it's we yep. just sold Shaka House last year, uh, Floyd Mayweather. Yes. Uh, right now we have uh, on uh, on the market the most famous house of all in all of Las Vegas. It's the biggest uh, property on the market. It's the most expensive one. Uh, it's the house that was in Vegas Family Vacation. It's uh, MTV Cribs called it the number two most expensive home that they've ever seen. Um, it's number two after Richard Branson's private island. It's wow. the Shenandoah Ranch. Wow. Uh, which is a 40 acre Arabian horse uh ranch with a hundred car museum. That's wow. the one you're it's driving through on your gram, right? That, yeah. that yeah. that's yeah. incredible. What's the asking yeah. price for that, Zar? Uh it's it's relatively cheap. It's uh 30 million bucks. That's cheap. And it's 30 million. Yeah. It's Nothing. very cheap. <laughs> well, it's cheap for what you get. For what yeah. you get, correct. Yeah. For yeah. 40 acres in the middle of the city. That's beautiful. Uh, so that's Wayne Newton's famous property that he's owned since the 50s, I believe, since the 50s. And I sold it once before in 2009 10. Uh, it's the only time it was ever sold, but he's remained a partial owner. And now we're selling it for land value for a development. Incredible. So it'll be torn down uh, probably. Wow. Amazing. Yeah. So, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of big time celebrities we've done, uh, we've done rental properties for Jay-Z and Beyonce in Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, just a lot of, you just recently also you sold to, uh, Mark Warburg, War Mark Wahlberg, Mark Wahlberg's, oh, yeah. uh, soon to be home, uh, soon to is be home. on a Correct. property that we represented here in Vegas, two lots, uh, that added up to over 25 million bucks, <laughs> uh, Yeah, just dirt. Yeah. Just, just dirt. $25 million bucks wow. for the dirt. Wow, wow, Gotta wow, love wow, it. wow. Gotta love it. it, it it's awesome. I, I want to go back to one thing. Do you keep in touch with Michael's kids still? Do you have any communication Sadly, no. with them? No. Okay. No. Unfortunately, I didn't want to ask that. Uh, nobody really does from their past, uh, since their passing. Even um, my understanding is even Grace, who was like their mother figure, their... Uh, Michael's best friend, uh, a woman named Grace, uh, after after Michael's mom, uh, Catherine, um, took custody of them after his passing. Mm -hmm. uh, Michael's mom is an extremely private woman and a Jehovah's Witness and, uh, and just uh, lives pretty sheltered. Mm -hmm. So she just kept them very... Um, secluded from the world and and now that they're older i don't know how much they remember from their past so 
No, I've had a couple of opportunities to meet them, and uh, I don't want to come off as as like a thirsty fan. Mm-hmm. So when when Paris has been in town, she's performed at one of my friends' venues here in town, and they invited me to come meet her, but I I didn't want to make her uncomfortable or say anything. So when the time's right, I'm sure it will happen. Um, but uh, but you know, I know Prince Michael, who in fact I I hosted Prince Michael's fifth birthday party. And invited some of Michael's friends there. We we had um, we had Siegfried and Roy there. We had my dear friend Darren Romeo, who's Siegfried and Roy's protege, performing mm-hmm. magic there. Mm-hmm. Uh, we we had a phenomenal birthday party for Prince Michael's fifth birthday party with a Spider Man cake. Um, <laughs> and and he's Walmart. an extremely shy kid. Um, and a, and a beautiful like uh, he he definitely I feel like has Michael's. Uh, beautiful heart and shy qualities. Um, I, I know Paris has uh, Michael's spirit of wanting to perform. Um, but, uh, you know, Paris uh, always had the most beautiful eyes and she was always ready to perform for her dad. And she was like such a daddy's girl. Mm-hmm. So uh, I, I, I'm sure I'm going to run into her at some point in the near future. Uh, Prince Michael seems to be so shy that uh, we'll see what happens there. But one of these days when the time's right, it will happen. Uh, I love it. Uh, honestly, I want to thank you so much for all this fantastic information. I think people are going to love listening. Didn't I tell you <laughs> I could, we got to bring my closest friend over here for the second episode? I, I love it. <laughs> we could probably go on for three hours. We're we'll already at that 90-minute mark. Yeah, we are. So where can people find you? Where can they follow you? Um, what would you like to plug? And what restaurants do you guys own in the city wow. if people want to come out and eat at your restaurants because you guys also own a bunch of restaurants? And guys, you want to learn from Amazing Zar? Go work for, uh, with him. Go hire him. Like, he's incredible. Why would you hire anyone else to sell your home or to buy a home if you live in the Vegas vicinity or anywhere else? So, uh, Zar, over to you. Yeah, I mean, uh, Vegas is amazing. It's home for me. Uh, we we have a phenomenal business here. So uh, the agency Las Vegas is where I am uh, every day. That's that's all I do. And we have a great team of uh, roughly 50 agents here that are all full-time agents. So if we could be of any service to you guys, you know where to find us. Uh, it's uh, on Instagram, the agency Las Vegas, and I am on Instagram and Facebook at Zar Zangane. Uh, and the restaurants are just, uh, I'm, I'm a part owner of that with my partner, Tony, who does all the sweating and hard part of that. He's so amazing. Tony's amazing. Tony is amazing. Runs uh, our three different concepts, three really cool places, greens and proteins, which is one of the top five healthy restaurants in the country. Um, they have locations all around Vegas, but it's a healthy joint that does all uh, very healthy meals, uh, bison burgers, lots of chicken, a lot of healthy, healthy items, and every single dish there can go vegan, can go vegetarian as well. Uh, we have a place that is very gluttonous and delicious and uh, great for kids. It's called I Heart Mac and Cheese. It's a oh. macaroni oh, it's and best. grilled cheese sandwich bar. So it's like if you've ever been to a Chipotle or a Subway, it's kind of the same thing, except all mac and cheese where you pick every topping, every cheese, everything, uh, or grilled cheese sandwich. And then Tony's uh, big addiction is coffee. We have a place called Badass Coffee, oh, love that. which is uh, the only chain in the country that has Hawaiian beans. So the only American beans grown and it's Kona coffee uh, and a Hawaiian twist on everything. So macadamia nut milk in the coffees, uh, breakfast sandwiches that are like um, spam and egg on Hawaiian king rolls. And that is super popular because we have the largest population of Hawaiians in Las Vegas outside of Hawaii. And if you just like really good, high quality premium coffee, it's badass coffee. There's a few of them coming to Las Vegas, but the first one is now open. I love coffee. You know how much I don't drink. You know that too much. And uh, they just we, we we were there actually. He was just putting Tony was putting uh, the finishes on the uh, uh, of the place, and he was he's working. He he works really hard. 
and uh, he's just an amazing, amazing person. I just, I just love Tony, and you're gonna see his body. Oh, Jesus Christ! <laughs> <laughs> he, so props to Tony. So he's he is, uh, he's, he's something else. I gotta tell you. And uh, anytime uh, the Czar and Tony be in town, and uh, of course we have to have chicken breast, so <laughs> because he eats yeah. clean. But the um, coffee, but coffee shop is absolutely amazing. Czar, I love you. You are love you. You, you are absolutely amazing, and I want everybody to know how amazing you are, and I want them to follow you. I want them to give you as much as love as you deserve which probably you deserve more than, than whatever it comes to you, my friend. You're extremely successful. Uh, you have shared a lot of knowledge in your passion in real estate as well as your, your whole uh, entrepreneurial concept and mind with everybody. And I, we wanted to do this, you know, for hard for everybody to understand that they can dream and dream bigger and, and, and one, once you have that, you can achieve anything in life, and 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 you've been you're you know I love you, so I can't wait to see you and give you a big ass hug and a kiss. You know that. I so, can't wait, Farhad, Peter. Thank you, boys, for your time. Thank you for the platform. Give my you. best to everybody at the office in Toronto. Can't wait to be kiss with you. Kiss yeah. Thank you again, and okay. thank you guys for tuning in to the Art of Greatness and witnessing Czar's greatness. We were excited to have him as a guest. Please like, subscribe, and comment down below. We'd love to hear your feedback. Hope you guys have a wonderful one. We'll see you guys in a few weeks with a new guest.